Welcome back to Worth Different Woodworking as we slowly wrap up this prerequisite course series. It's a series of videos I've kind of constructed for those just getting into the craft because there's a lot of vocabulary terms, theories, ideas of tools and what tools do and that kind of stuff that a lot of new woodworkers might not quite grasp and it could be a real hindrance to learning even if you don't have the tools or have even started making sawdust yet. At least getting this foundation level knowledge will really ramp up the learning curve as you do start making sawdust. The final video in this series is going to be about buying the material we use, the hardware, software, plywood, that kind of stuff. But this one is all about what, tool do, what tools do and why. Now in the very first episode in this series, I talked about all the tools and how they were all designed based around a simple chisel and how you presented that chisel to the wood, whether it's a ripping or cross cut action. But I didn't really go into details of what these a lot of these individual tools, their purposes was. The physics of how they work and some minor things you might need to know about safety aspects before you even approach them. And that's what this video is going to be about. Now I am doing a general DIY woodworking shop kind of thing. We're going to go from hand tools to power tools to stationary machinery and compare and contrast those kind of different approaches to our craft. But I'm not going to dive deep into like the little niches like wood turning or carving or you know intarsia work or timber framing. I'm kind of looking at this from a person working out the garage and the stuff they'd make for around their home. So while understanding I'm going to be covering a lot of machineries and tools here, also understand it's for a kind of generalized woodworker, not a specialist. Then I'm also going to be talking about the types of material these machines or tools use. I mean, there are a lot of machines that can handle uh, grain wood, basically stuff straight from the tree, still in a log or maybe a section of a log with bark on it, completely green, which, you know, having the moisture in it and how that affects the tools is a big deal. There are a lot of tools that just can't handle green woodwork, wood or woodworking with green wood. Then you have uh, rough sawn stuff. And that's basically when a sawmill will section out stuff and then let it dry. You know, that drying process induces movement, twist. The surface might be a little rough. It might have a lot of dirt in it. There are a lot of machines that just can't handle those kind of variables. And finally, we're going to be talking about machines that handle just dimensioned lumber. And that's that rough wood that's already been straightened, flattened, and smoothed. There, are some machines that just require very precise material and able to operate safely. We'll also cover the type of work this stuff these machines do, whether it be cross cutting, ripping, resawing, or shaping or surfacing. All those mach machines have different purposes, so you have different cuts to achieve your given goal. Also, understand that we are just kind of glossing over a lot of stuff. This is just basic description, function, safety aspect. I've got about 10 years of videos out there. So if I've done an in-depth dive of it, I'll probably put a link down in the description to those videos. And I might do a screenshot in the corner of the thumbnail of the video so you can find it in a Google search or a YouTube search. Let's start by talking about saws. Saws come in a wide range of sizes, shapes to serve different functions. Let's start out with what we call hand saws. And this is what you traditionally think of when you think of vintage saws. They do have bigger saws right here. They're designed to like cut down trees or buck up trees into sections that we can chop with an ax. I'm not gonna include them in this video for the simple reason that most people aren't gonna be doing that in their garage shop. We generally start with a hand saw. A handsaw is generally sized about the length of your arm or a little bit more. And it's actually used on something uh, like a bench where you're leaning down on top of the work. Or on a construction site where you're leaning over uh, saw horses and sawing down. Because you're using the entire length of your arm. That's why this length is here. They also have fairly uh, big teeth with big gullets. 
because you're taking shavings that are much bigger with this tooth to get a lot more work done. This is not a fine instrument. The teeth have to be that big because as you're sawing wood, the little shavings kind of curl up inside each one of these teeth. And if you don't have a big enough gullet, well, those shavings will actually push the saw out of the wood and it will stop cutting. They also have to be big enough so that after the wood pa saw passes through the wood, they will release that saw, saw shaving. So on the drawback up, it's going to be nice and clear for the next stroke. If you get a too small a gullet, saws don't work very well for wasps. Where was I? Oh, if you get too small a gullet, uh, it will actually heat up more because the, the wood will, won't come out and just doesn't work very well. Which is why as you get a finer and finer cut, you will see that you get finer and finer teeth with smaller and smaller gullets with the teeth closer and closer together. Because they aren't actually doing as much work the smaller you get, but you gain a lot more accuracy and you get a better cut. This right here is a lot of times a third class cut unless you have somebody like a carpenter who is sectioning up two by fours which you know a lot of times if they get within a 30 second of an inch they are really happy so the coarser the tooth the less accurate it has to be and by far this is not going to be a cosmetically pretty cut the next size saw you typically see is what a lot of times we call a panel saw and these both all of these saws that we're going to be talking about come in both a rip cut which means you're sawing along with the tree or a cross cut which means you're sawing across the tree a panel saw is actually designed so that you can work at your workbench on panels and stuff like that so if you're needing to cut a long three or four foot or even a full door length strip this is the saw you will use because your arm doesn't have as much movement up as the workbench so it can be quite a bit shorter. It's also sized to fit in a lot of tool chests. This too, I would not call a first or second class style cut because most of the time you're going to refine the cut with a hand plane. You'll cut close to the line and plane back to it. Now, the Japanese saws have their variations. And you'll notice this is, uh, I always forget them, dozukas or something like that. They have different terms for whether it's a cross cut or rip, but for the most part, they work a lot like our saws do in that they don't have a solid back on the back, creating it very rigidly because the teeth are designed to cut on the pull stroke, not on the push stroke. So when you're pulling it, it stays in tension to keep the blade straight. If you were to push on it, it flexes quite a bit. The European style saws, like this one right here, well, they have a lot thicker metal here to maintain that rigidness when you're pushing it. But you can also do that musical stuff with it, which Roy Underhill does all the time. I'm not that talented. But it, the rigidity comes from the amount of metal in the blade. And the bigger the saw, the thicker that blade is going to be. In addition, the teeth on the saw, they're going to have more set meaning they are going to be spread apart farther so the smaller you get the finer you get not only do the teeth get smaller but the set gets smaller why is that important well if you're sawing rough lumber you're releasing a lot of tension in the wood a lot of times so that it can pinch or pinch on the blade well if you have a wider curve which is the amount of wood the saw removes well it can move a little bit without creating as much pressure on the saw and the greener the wood, generally the bigger that set needs to be. Because as moisture comes out of the wood, it kind of mixes with sawdust and fur on the slurry and that kind of binds everything up so it gets really hard to saw. So as strange as it sounds, when you're cutting fresh wood straight from a tree or cutting a tree down, you actually want to remove more wood to make it easier to cut and to steer. Now, as you work down, we get into the realm of the back saws. And the back saws, for the most part, are used on dimensioned lumber. It's not gr green, green wood uh, or rough wood. The hand saws and the panel saws handle those, uh, that kind of stuff. 
because of that, they generally have a lot finer teeth and a lot less set because the wood is pretty much dried or at least ready to use and join up. These are where you start getting into the cuts that you would call second class cuts, where, they be, where accuracy becomes a lot more important than just getting the wood removed or separated or split. It's also why you start seeing smaller and smaller saws because if you add more muscles into the mass, your accuracy becomes less. You actually want to start isolating your body to gain control on these. So a back saw is designed just to move the distance about right there. So all you're really moving is this part of your body. Everything else is still so you gain accuracy. And as you go down to finer and finer joinery cuts, you generally get smaller and smaller saws. To the point where you have very tiny saws that have absolutely no set on them, and they're very flexible, and they, these are called flush cutting saws, but sometimes we'll use them in joinery. Now there are also saws that cut curves, things like bow saws and stuff like that. And generally those are going to hold the blade in tension between two points with a pretty big gap, but they are very thin blades so that you can turn corners. And they typically have a lot of set to remove wood so that the blade can move around within that area. They take a little bit of skill to use, but the most common version you'll see in a small shop would be something like a coping saw. And you can make nice decorative cuts with this kind of tool. Now what kind of hand tool saws would be nice in a entry level shop? Well, I don't think you're going to need a uh, hand saw, uh, something really coarse rip like that. Because for the most part, you're going to have some kind of power tool to do a lot of the brunt work of turning long boards into thinner boards. That is, those are the workhorses. But it would be nice to have a panel saw, maybe in a crosscut configuration, to help break down materials. Because a lot of times, breaking down long stuff and cutting them into smaller sections can be somewhat clunky with certain power tools, especially if you don't have a lot of skill off the get-go as to whether uh, it would also be nice to have a back saw to making more accurate cuts. And if you like doing decorative little curves or cutting little, out little animals out of plywood or something like that, a coping saw would be fun. But whether you want to go with European styles, meaning on the push up or Japanese, kind of depends upon what kind of woodworking you want to do. European styles, for the most part, are resharpenable. Though you can buy these cheap ones from the big box stores with hardened teeth, which are pretty much priced to be disposable, because you can't really sharpen those teeth. But if you go vintage, those are going to be lifetime investments. And they are more designed to work a European way, meaning up at a workbench. You are pressing into the work and pushing away from your body to get the work done. Whereas I said earlier, Japanese style, pull style saws, you're generally pulling towards yourself. A lot of times these are meant to be used in a seating position where you're using your body to brace a work and it pulls back towards you. Very, very accurate that way. But if you're working in the workbench, you're going to have to adjust a lot of the traditional clamping methods and stuff like that in order to use these to their full potential. It can be done. There are a lot of people that do it. There are a lot of people that like prefer these because the blades are replaceable so you never have to learn how to sharpen and they for a beginner they cut a little bit easier but that's a very sharp learning curve because I got into these when I first started because everyone told me they were easier to use but you end up replacing the blades so often because I use very hard woods like pecan, hickory, and stuff like that that have pores, so you just snap these teeth off left and right unless you have just the ultimate control and technique, which most beginners don't. So I found that the European styles that were resharpenable and a little bit thicker and a little bit more robust for clumsy hands, they just worked out better for me. And once you go down one path, you're pretty much going to stick that way. If you tend to work at a workbench, I can tell you in six months, you're going to be very, you would be very glad if you went the European route. That zero to six months, you'll kind of go back and forth if you had both options as to which one you preferred. Now let's venture into the world of some common power saws. Now, to be upfront, 
DeWalt did provide, uh, give me this jigsaw six or seven months ago for a video I was doing. And they're going to be loaning me this track saw for uh, this video series and another video series when my, me and my dad build out a woodworking shop as we combine shops later on. So, uh, but that's kind of irrelevant for this particular video because we're talking about the types of saws, uh, not the specific models or brands. Now, in the power saws, it kind of mimics the hand tools in the purpose, what type of material they use, and the kind of cut you're going to be getting. Let's start out with a very common saw. This is a reciprocating saw. And notice that the saw blade does not have any kind of back on it. So it's actually designed to be cut on the pull stroke, which is really, really good because the force is actually going into the base. If it was go uh, designed to cut on the push stroke, well, this saw would actually always be pushing back at you. It'd be very hard to control. By having it coming into the base right here, the, the force of the horsepower of the motor is somewhat counteracted. And you can put different blades in these saws, so you can get them with different thicknesses of teeth and stuff like that. So this is the kind of saw that, you know, you will commonly uh, see used as a demo saw or, or a sawzall or something like that. But it can also be used on green wood for like cutting branches and stuff like that because you can get the saw blades for specific tasks. But notice, this is not going to be a first or second class kind of cut. This is a very rough cutting machine. And I used to like carrying this little version right here in my truck to help me break down material to get into the back of it because it, it didn't take up too much space and it was fairly quick at uh, the hardware store or lumber yard. But for all intents and purposes, that kind of saw, unless you're doing a lot of refab or construction work, it's not really unnecessary because you can do a lot of the same things with a jigsaw. Once again, the way the teeth are designed, they're cutting on the pull stroke coming in to the surface. So the torque counteracts each other against the brace. That's how you can control it. And you can get different kinds of teeth, saws, for the teeth. This is a tool that you can use for rough material. I wouldn't, I can't see any application for green material unless you're just cutting up slab, cutting sections out of slabs after they've already been slabbed. Uh, but it will handle rough material because the base is so short and the blade is fairly flexible. So if you have any twist or cupping or anything like that, this thing doesn't really care. This to me is a third class cut. It's a rough cut. It's never going to be a finished cut. You're always going to refine it after the fact, but it can get a lot of rough work done very, very quickly. But one thing I need to point out to you, look at this blade kind of short right typical size blade each individual teeth does a lot of work so these blades are disposable and you need to replace them a lot more often than you think because each individual tooth is doing so much more work than other comparable saws they just dull a lot faster now I should tell you that for the longest time in my career I hated jigsaws uh, I could never get a plumb cut with them, meaning close to 90 degrees. Not only were the platforms moving around, but the blades would kind of wander for the thickness of the, uh, from the tension in the wood or the growth rings of the wood. So that's why I consider this a rough tool because you're always going to be refining it. And I had a corded version of this tool for most of my woodworking career, and I could honestly tell you the past five years I probably never touched it it just gathered dust in there I just didn't use it but whenever I got sent a cordless version of this one I'm finding myself using it so much more because it's more flexible like I my hand saws where those hand saws and the panel saws where I would break down material in the past put a board up section it up and then come back over and refine it with a back saw or a hand plane to get perfect for for my setup 
Nowadays, I'm pulling this thing out, cutting 2x12s in half or something like that. It's just so much easier because of that battery pack. I can just leave it underneath my workbench and use it more like a hand tool. Just grab and go. And if you're just getting into the craft, a cordless version of that might be a luxury tool that you'll get so much use for that you will turn to over and over again because of its convenience and flexibility for the rough stuff. Next up, let's talk about circular saws. Circular saws have kind of become the backbone of the DIY and construction community uh, for decades. Uh, whereas it used to be the hand saws, the cross cut saws, or the predominant one. I'm not going to tell you these kinds of saws are better than those old hand saws. I'm not even going to tell you they are faster. I've seen way too many videos of great grandfathers having a hand saw on their back, hopping up on the rafters, and using techniques within the saws of capturing uh, reflections in the blade to get 45, 50, 22 and a half degrees, dead on perfect. And really a sharp hand saw a few strokes and you're through a 2x4. It's not that slow or hard a thing to do. A properly tooled tool is not going to wear you out. It just took a little bit of learning out there. But when these things came about, you know, you can line these things up with a with a square on your bench and cut square every single time. You can cut 45 degrees. You can use these it seemed that it took the new person on the construction crew a lot less time to develop skills with this than it did a handsaw. Plus the fact we, did, we work, started working with sheet goods and cutting long strips with these was quicker than a handsaw simply because you weren't having to move around as much. But injuries spiked whenever you start working with these. People cut their legs left and right all the time with these tools if they aren't careful. And yes, they have things like guards and stuff to protect it, but one of the first things you see a lot of people do on construction sites is take these things up out of the way. And very rarely are they going to change the depth of the cut to prevent it from cutting too deeply into the body part if it gets away from you. And they will get away from you because of the type of material they are designed to cut construction lumber. It is not, they call it kill and dry, but there's generally a lot of moisture in there, so it will move on you. It will bind up on the back of the blade. You cut it in the front, the battery's out, you cut it in the front, if it squeezes on the back of the blade, it can bind up and catch on you, which means these things are designed to spin this way so that they, the force of the cutting action is coming up into the plate. That's how you can control it. If it was spinning the other way, it would like work like a car burning rubber. The thing would just want to grip and run away from you, and that would be very dangerous. But if you think about it, the back of the blade is doing that. It's If it is cutting on the back side in any way, it's wanting to grip and run back at you. That's the catch you talk about. And if you think about how you use these kind of tools, you are grabbing a 2x12 or something like that, and you are pushing through the board. Well, you are pushing that board forward and cutting at it, cutting it, so it actually wants to bend up like that, thus squeezing the back of the blade. And how many times have you seen somebody sawing something and it kind of started gating? grabbing on then jerks a little bit back. That's a minor catch. And I see that actually all the time with experts who are taking this a tool like this, bracing a board against their body, sawing it off in the air, and then towards the end they'll kind of catch and grab, but they've done it so often it's second nature to somewhat control that so it goes away from them. It amazes me some of the videos I watch of pro construction people is they just don't even seem to notice those catches anymore just because it's happened so often to them. But something like that with a beginner could result in some fairly dangerous accidents. There are safe ways of working these tools. A lot of times it involves getting on your hands and knees, 
laying something that a, something that's sacrificial underneath you and then sawing on top of it. That way, there's no chance the tool can come back and hit you because you are literally on top of the work and you're not don't have any body parts underneath the cutting edge. These really are a tool that it kind of boggles my mind that so many brand new woodworkers gravitate towards in the beginning. I guess it's just because what it's what they see other people doing. But it is a splinting, spinning blade that you're controlling at the end of your wrist. One of the weakest points of your body. So much articulation you for you to have to control a one-third to one-half horsepower motor interacting with something that has a lot of grip to get away from you. And that grip is a lot higher with a dull blade. Once again, just like on that jigsaw, I think people spent, uh, go way far past sharpness, safe sharpness level with most of their blades on these kinds of tools. Where they don't clean it enough, especially with the soft woods we are cutting, that you get a lot of pitch buildup on the side of the tooth, and that just adds to the traction of the blade. If you're going to go ahead and buy a circular saw, I really do suggest you contact an expert on how to use it so you can have it operate it safely. Which is why I really like the idea of these track saws. Now track saws can work on rough lumber if you have the right appliances that go with them. A track saw works in conjunction with a track. And these tracks generally have some kind of groove that the bottom of the plate of these are going to ride in. And that isolates a lot of twisting action, which not only makes your cuts more accurate, but if you do get some kind of catch or it wants to move independent of what your muscles want it to move, it kind of locks it in so the force goes into the track and is spread out over a larger surface so it's much much safer plus the sheer fact that you have to use a track means that you're using the material in a way that generally you are more on top of the piece whether you're working across a workbench or a work surface or down on the ground or even if you're using it on soft horses or stuff like that where your legs are still below it the fact that the track is here you're farther away from the work Plus the fact that the tracks, a lot of times, allow for safety devices, such as that right there, which if the machines start to lurch back at you, they clamp down to prevent it from moving backward. So it can only move forward. And finally, they have one feature that is on almost all new table saws. Batteries out of it. And that is... A writhing knife. A piece of metal behind the blade so that if the wood starts to compress or tension on the back of the blade or pinch on it, it'll actually pinch on this instead of the spinning part that can lurch around on you and get away. Such an awesome safety feature. In my mind, a brand new woodworker, I would be a lot more comfortable allowing them to use a track saw versus a circular saw but like everything in life you know it includes more precise parts more safety devices attached into the machine itself more precision stuff like that the cost of this versus this can be extreme for somebody just getting into the craft but the safety aspect of it alone justifies that to me if I was teaching a new student. Plus the fact that because these are on tracks you get a lot more accurate cuts so these are designed more for finished material, finished stuff. Yes I did say you could use it on rough material like 2x12s and stuff but using them on jigs or setups cutting joinery is well within the grasp of this machine. This machine more second class cuts but you could get first class cuts on something like this this is an alternative to a table saw and speaking of stationary power tools for a lot of woodworkers the table saw is the heart of their wood shop i will tell you this 
I do not hold that opinion. My opinion is the table saw is really a production-based machine. It's something that if you you're going to use for lots of repeated cuts over and over and over. The price of a decent table saw, and I do have a video out to help guide you how to select what class of table saw you actually need. The price can be pretty extreme to get a decent quality one that will last your lifetime. And there are a lot of accessories that you need to buy, use, and tune to allow this machine to do a lot of the joinery that you could do with a simple $20 hand saw. But for mass production work or even small production runs in a, in a shop like mine, uh, this is a very nice luxury to have. But I've always heard that in machine work, more people get injured on a bandsaw, more people get maimed on a table saw, more people die from a lathe. The lathe thing is generally people turning something really huge, not securing it, and you get a 300 pound spinning thing flying back at you. That can easily be avoided by not turning 300 pound spinning things. The table saw, generally when something bad happens, you end up losing digits. Very rarely is it just going to be a stitch up where the, there's a high percentage you're losing digit. On the bandsaw, a lot of times you're moving slow enough that you can hurt yourself pretty badly, but it's not a amputation kind of thing. And I also think more people get injured on bandsaws for the simple reason there are more bandsaws being used in stuff like meatpacking industries, metal shops. There's a lot broader range of it. I mean, there are bandsaws in most, most butcher shops and grand... And, uh, in uh, grocery stores so if there are just more out there it makes sense that there are more people getting injured on them but the fact that more people get maimed on a table saw tells you a lot and a lot of it happens simply because of a lack of safety equipment and thought into what kind of wood you're moving over the machine a table saw is really meant for finished material yes you can do rough sawn stuff uh, right straight from the lumber mill but generally it's better to have run it over something like a jointer to make sure you have nice straight edges so that you can bump it up against a fence or something like that. If you have a board that has a kind of a twist into it or something like that and you're running it through on the fence, but well, the back of the fence it could be at a certain angle and then as you progress it, the angle could move in and you could be putting pressure on the blade this way or even worse, if the curve is this way, you're putting pressure on the back of the blade. And if you remember me talking about the circular saw, the back of the blade is where some wicked things can happen. On a table saw, because the saw is rotating towards you, the force is actually coming back at you a little bit. And as long as you can keep progressing forward, it's a fairly safe cut. And in the extreme situations where the blade really, really high, you can see that the force is somewhat going down into the table, just like it was going into the underside of that circular saw. It's generally unwise to keep a blade a lot higher than the piece you're cutting, just because there's more blade exposed there. This is unplugged, by the way. So you can, you can see how things could go missing if something bad happened. The general rule of thought is you want to keep it so that about the gullet, or half the gullet, is above the blade. That way, if something bad, bad happens, you might lose a finger still, but it won't be, it won't be life-threatening. Or it could be. But the downside of this, this setup is you always have to have the piece of work moving forward. You can never let it stop, otherwise it could catch and get thrown back at you. But remember me talking about wood touching the back of the blades. Now most modern saws have something called this riving knife. Kind of like that track saw. In fact, this is probably where they got the idea. Without that, if you're using this saw, there's nothing preventing a board from pinching on the back of the blade for some reason, riding up and being tossed at you. And when that happens, guess what direction it moves your hand? 
it's spinning around coming back this way because it's pivoting off your fence your hand goes directly over the blade which is one reason why you never want your hand anywhere in this red area you're always using push sticks but again that is a lot of safety knowledge that a new woodworker might not know and even an experienced woodworker might be ignoring <laughs> So in most operations on a table saw, you're generally wanting to use material that has already been straightened or flattened so that there's no rocking or move, uh, motion as you're progressing over the blade. Now that isn't to say that you can't do rough stock on a table saw. There are a lot of jigs and stuff like that where you can use clamps to anchor it down so it can't move. It is isolated and then pass it over the blades. There's always ways to do stuff. but it's not native to just setting up the saw and going. You're going to have to study, research, and build stuff to be able to go around the guidelines of traditional use. But what is cool about a table saw is that you can do most of the major cuts and you can do them in the first class situation, second, and third class situation. I think most people uh, work in the first and second class, meaning highly accurate but not in sight, or something in sight that also needs to be highly accurate. And you can do it in all three ways. You can cross cut, you can rip it, and up to about twice the height of the blade, you can resaw by resawing half of it one way and half of it the other. Though, I don't recommend doing that one because there is some finesse to that kind of stuff. Whereas the bandsaw, well, let me put it to you this way. I would not want to work in a woodworking shop if I didn't have a bandsaw. I can use hand tools for everything else, but the luxury of having a bandsaw is something I just don't want to deal without. I believe that so much so that in the follow-up series to this one, I'm calling it a start woodworking series, where we're actually going to start making a mess. Well, it's all going to be hand tools. And we built this bench right here in the first episode. And the rest of the series is going to be work we can do at this bench with a very small set of hand tools and a 10-inch bandsaw. And whenever I, I talked to Rikon about the concept, they did go ahead and loan me this 10-inch bandsaw for the series so that I could show the general audience what you could do with a fairly inexpensive bandsaw that would sit on a workbench in the corner of your shop along with all your other tools sitting underneath the bench so you could actually get work done in a very limited amount of space when you put a priority on developing skills over acquiring tools. That's just a side note. The reason why I like the bandsaw so much for a small shop, the kind of shop I had until I started doing some production work to help pay the bills, is that it is as close to a handsaw, like all those hand, large handsaws you can have and still have electrons doing most of the work. It is literally, you can draw a line on a board, come over here and saw the line. And yes, this will never be a first class cut. You can do second class cuts like uh, Morrison tenon, tenon faces and stuff like that, but you're never going to cut a board in half then take it up and glue up and get a perfect glue joint. You're going to have to touch that same piece of uh, fiber with something like a hand plane to get it to that level. But it gets a lot of work done, and I say it gets work done fairly safely. I mean, you could be coming, sawing something through here, and if something scares you, step away. Turn it off. There isn't another stationary power tool that you can really do that one. Table saw likely something's going to get thrown back at you. This one, you can do that one. Now, there are some dangers to it. Uh, you know, a ba blades occasionally bla break if you misuse them, but you can learn to anticipate that. And when they do break, they generally break within this housing. Very rarely have I seen one, I've never seen one live break and come inside, but I have been told that that can happen. And you never really want to push your hands 
towards a blade, obviously. So, a lot of times you're pushing your hands off to the side, or you can put a fence on it. Run it up against the fence, keeping your ways, your hand going away from it. Or, even better, you can cut curves. Something you just can't do with a table saw. And when you do that one, all you need to do is concentrate on feeding work into the blade, but your hands moving away from it. And you can do all the same cuts that you could on the table saw. The rip cuts. Fairly straight with a fence, a cross cut. You can even make a fence, that uh, a sled that rides on it, or use something like a speed square to squ square it up from the side. You could just draw a line and freehand eyeball it through, and you can even resaw to a certain level. But you can resaw a much thicker piece than you can on the table saw. Plus, because this blade is designed to flex in order to go around the wheel. It's also designed to flex here. Let me tighten it up. Even tightened up, it can flex. It can move. That way, you can also use uh, green wood straight from the tree. You can actually work that kind of wood on a bandsaw. You can do rough stock. This is the safest way to cut rough stock. And if you do it right, you can get a flattened face so that you could take it to something like the table saw or something like that. I just find a bandsaw is so much more flexible for a one-man shop that's making a wide variety of different items and they want to have some power tool to take a little bit of the grunt work away from them. Though, just like the jigsaw, just like the, the circular saw, I do find that people let their blades get way too dull before they swap them out. And swapping them out isn't that much money, but it is somewhat of a disposable expense. Not too many bandsaws in the low price range are you going to find that are resharpenable. You can, but why do it? Because I buy these from a local place for I think eight dollars, seven or eight dollars for the ten inch size. My fourteen inch bandsaw which is my main band, so this one I have just for that series coming up. They run me $13. If I run through one of those once a month, as much as I use them, that's not that great a big expense. But the smaller the bandsaw you get, this being a 10 incher, each one of the individual teeth do more work than the individual teeth on a 14 inch, an 18 inch, a 36 inch. Those big giant bandsaws, their, their blades stay sharp for quite a long time because each individual teeth is doing a less of a percentage of the work. Another really common saw, power saw you see is the ubiquitous chop saw or miter saw out there. A very dedicated one, one purpose kind of tool. It's going to cross cut board. You're never going to rip a board. You're never going to uh, resaw a board on this one. This is just for sticking a board here and cutting it in half at some degree either this way or even beveling it that way very efficient machine and if you are doing a lot of diy remodeling putting up walls building sheds and stuff like that this is a great device though you can get away with the same functionality with that circular saw i mentioned earlier and making a quick little jig to hold it would make it a lot safer or Frankly, you can do it with the jigsaw. Uh, same exact thing. You put your square on the side of a board, reach down, grab your jigsaw, and there you go. You make your 90 degree cuts, your 45 degree cut. But there's also one other saw I kind of want to introduce to y'all because I don't see it in a lot of small shops, and I don't know why. It is so fun, so flexible, allows you to do so much more items with utmost precision. You know, when I talk to a lot of students, you know, you ask them what got you into the hobby, a lot of times they'll say they saw something really cool or they'll bring you a picture. I want to be able to learn to do this one, this kind of stuff. And a lot of times they'll have nice intricate little cuttings on it or shapes. It's not always just square mission style furniture. 
And if you're getting into detail work, or if you like to doodle and draw, or you want to make jewelry, or you want to do uh, cutouts, piercings, and work, I highly suggest looking at a scroll saw. A scroll saw is just a powered uh, coping saw or fret saw, but it allows you to bring out a lot of creativity and enhance a lot of your work. Plus the fact for clearing out things like dovetail ways or finger joint ways, it's a great little resource to have in the corner. It doesn't make that big a mess. It's fairly quiet. I mean, you can do this in front of the TV, and the speeds it moves, it's a fairly safe item. I would not hesitate to put a responsible kid on this cutting out animals or letters or making signs or that kind of stuff. The scroll saw is a great option to look into if you're getting into the craft and you want to just explore some stuff and also refine your skills and make some really fine items as gifts or say and this kind of tool operates using a fret saw blade it's squeezed on a little pincher kind of like on this side both ends are like that you kind of put it in tighten it up you tighten up the blade so it it rings then you can turn it on and it's going to do the sawing action for you you can slow it down you can speed it up with the dial and this just allows you to do really intricate curves fairly simply. So imagine being able to draw a lot, a lot of holes in something and maybe doing stuff like making jigsaw puzzles or little art cutouts in a necklace or something like that. The options are really open, and this is such a compact and flexible tool for a lot of different stuff. This just seems like a great option to get into the craft if you don't have a lot of space or money or access to material, but you still want to make fine stuff such as pendants or signs or anything like that to impress your friends and learn more about the craft. Now let's talk about planning. Planning is where the accuracy comes into our craft. It's where we get our straight lines, smooth curves. The visual aspect of what we're building gets refined with hand planes. And the general consensus is, you, if you're doing bench work, you're making furniture or projects for your house or stuff like that, you kind of want three hand planes. You want something called a jointer, and that makes your stuff dead flat, dead smooth, but not necessarily cosmetically perfect. This is an accuracy plane. Then you want a smoothing plane. This one doesn't make it accurate, but it makes it really, really pretty. This is what takes care of a lot of the sanding aspects. makes everything dead smooth. And it is the shortest one so that it can ride in and out of undulations easier because this distance will fit better and the blade will contact the work. This one is long so that if you have two undulations, it's not going to take a shaving off of the open area. It's just going to take a shaving off of the two high spots. And it'll work it until it gets it flat. Then in the middle, you have what's called the workhorse. The jack plane. The jack of all trades. And a lot of people will have multiple blades for these. And this just takes heavy shavings or light shavings. It does a little bit of everything. Generally, if you're starting out with rough lumber... We're not talking green lumber, we're talking rough lumber. You will get it most of the way flat. You'll take away any twist, any cup, any bow with your jack plane. At which point you should only have to spend a few minutes working your jointer plane to get it dead smooth. And then just a few strokes in each area to make it look good. Now, that's the book definition of which hand planes you do use. Some people will actually add a block plane in there to do ingrain work and make, do chamfers and stuff like that. That's not really what I use because I don't really make a lot of big furniture. You know, I make little cabinets, little boxes, that kind of stuff. So for my applications, these right here are only here for demonstration. Though for the upcoming class, just FYI, I'm using an inexpensive jack plane and an inexpensive 
uh, block plane. Those are the only two planes we're going to be using in the class. For my personal use and all the videos you see, I generally use a bevel up jack plane and I will use this as my jointer, my jack, and my smoother a lot of times. Because the general idea is if your plane is three times the length of your board, you can use it as a jointer. Well, one, two, three. How many times am I make, making something the width of my arm span? Not very often. So I don't really need a lot, a, a big, huge jointer in order to get two boards to glue up. I do have a smoother I use quite a bit. And this is a little finicky little thing that just takes the wispiest of shavings. But I have a oversized block plane that I also use as a smoother quite a bit. That's why I ordered the auxiliary knob up front so it will be more natural feeling using as a smoother. So technically I could get away with just two planes for almost all the work I do with the exception of curved work. And in that case, the spoke shave comes in because that's all a spoke shave is. It is a very tiny plane with a very narrow bed so that you can go around corners and up through corners. You generally have two different kinds of spoke shaves. One's got a flat bottom for working around and one's got a curved bottom for working concave. Now, in the power tool realm, they have had powered versions of hand planes for quite a while. And they are basically using three blades that spin around in a direction. So as you push this way, the, the planes are wanting to move it back that way. So it's a counteracting force to gain you control. And just nice little straight blades that you can resharpen just like any hand plane. And the difference between this and a traditional hand plane is this sole is completely flat all the way across and the blade protrudes a little bit. Whereas in this blade, these two are in plane. They are parallel to each other, but the front moves up and down to expose material. So it actually has to remove material from this plane in order to ride on this plane. And that removes it just that right amount. I personally really like these for flattening table tops and stuff like that and bench tops. And that's the only reason I had it is for flattening bench tops. I had a corded version earlier and I just acquired this uh, cordless one because of I'm about to build a new bench with all that material and I have some tabletop projects I'm doing. And if you don't want to get a big router sled and all that kind of stuff to flatten it out, this is an easy way to get most of the way done just like a jack plane, and then I can hit it with that jointer and that smoother to make it look nice. And that's the traditional way you make stuff flat. Now, hand planes, spoke shaves, that kind of stuff, you can work them on the edges of boards, on the faces of boards, and on the ends of boards. A powered version where it's rotating like this, you can work these to flatten and straighten the sides of board, the edges of boards, and the faces of boards. Do not use them on the ends of boards because bad things will happen because the end grain is so much harder and they will split and that rotation aspect is just putting too much power into it. And that's the same exact situation when you step up to stationary power tools. A jointer is designed to be able to work on the edge of a board and the face of a board, but you never do the end of the board across it. That's when bad things can happen, just like the powered hand tool. Because in essence, what we're talking about is turning this thing upside down. Because just like this, the front of the bed and the back of the bed, they are completely parallel, but the front goes up and down to determine how much you remove off the edge. And it cuts just enough so that it will line up with the outfeed table. That's why when I'm moving this board right across it right now, it stops right there because it's not on, it's not removing that material. Now, just like that one right there, it uses straight knives that you can resharpen. Sharpen. But I will tell you, in the modern age, a lot of people are using carbide little chiclets. So you might have 200 or more, 
you might have 30 or 40 little chiclets that are serving the same purpose as those straight edges and because they can cant them at a little angle it doesn't hit the board head on it kind of comes at an angle which is a lighter cut on both the wood and the tool so they tend to last quite a bit longer as far as sharpness wise these kinds of blades because they're hitting end grain face on so often they dull and nick quite a bit but they are resharpenable now the kind of sister power tool to the jointer is the thickness planer and you can consider it a planing tool because planing is in its name but what's unique about this tool is it will not flatten work all it does is make wood that's parallel sides because the cutting heads are on top of this machine and it has rollers that press it down press the wood down so that it can get a specific distance from the top to the fixed base so if you have a board that has a cup to it or something like that it's actually going to press it flat and the cutter actions all they do is make it an equal distance from the bed so it comes out parallel so if a board goes in cupped or twisted or anything like that it's going to come out cupped or twisted or anything like that just a consistent thickness the jointer is a tool that you use to flatten and straighten this just makes up the pair the sides parallel and like a jointer there are modern versions that use those carbide chiclets that give you a little bit better finish they stay a sharper a lot longer and they make the tool a lot quieter i will tell you this while most jointers they have a a uh, induction style motor that's a lot quieter so all you're really hearing is the cutting action these things the lunchbox ones that most of us can afford in a small garage shop they use a universal motor that's actually screaming at high rpms and it's actually geared down whereas this thing it's generally geared up to create the proper speeds for the cutting head this by far is the loudest tool that's going to be in your woodworking shop so not only do you need hearing protection you need neighbors that won't call the cops on you and the final powered hand plane is a versatile little router now depending on how you use it you can get nice straight edges you know if you put it up against a fence you can also do curves and stuff like that by using bearings and running around a template or something like that it is in effect a spoke shape it just burns electrons instead of fat. Maybe I need to use this a little bit more. Next, I'd like to talk about finishing tools. And this could be something as simple as a piece of sandpaper in your hand, you know, fold it up a couple times. You can round over edges, stuff like that. You put it in a, a some kind of block with a little bit of pad. It could be a store-bought one or just a hunk of two by four with a piece of leather on the glued to the bottom side of it. You wrap the sandpaper around that one. It will serve you the same malfunction. I kind of like using these little pads. They're somewhat disposable, but they tend to last me a long time, especially when I am surfacing like milk paint and stuff, just removing little dust nubs and stuff. Go over with the pad, rinse it out, and move on. But can also mean edge tools, such as a card scraper. A simple, you know, one, two dollar card scraper it will last you decades of use and it can eliminate so much sanding. Now, I do know that people are out there that will tell you that it will eliminate all sanding. But for me, I find that if I go over my work with a scraper or something like that, I can generally start sanding at something like 220, 320, or 400 grit and not have to worry about it. But this right there, that is really smooth and it will take care of any like plane tracks or something like that. If you're doing a very large table, well, getting a dedicated cabinet scraper it's basically the same exact thing except it's got handles on it it just makes doing large sections a lot easier and it, because it has something of flat surface it adds a little bit of flattening ability now i haven't worked this is just a 2 by 12 i pulled out so it's still got some ribbons on it that's why i'm getting some jerkiness but if i had taken a hand plane to it first and then come back with this very likely i wouldn't need to sand at all but if you are going to sand, you're probably going to end up with something like one of these. The standard belt sander is pretty ubiquitous in shops. You have a belt of sandpaper that runs around. To me, this is kind of like a jack plane. 
it will do a lot of grunt work put some coarse paper on it because it has a little bit of a bed to it it can flatten out some stuff but I've never had much luck going much beyond 120 grit sandpaper on this tool it just doesn't seem to work as well for me because it kind of induces some waviness that I particularly don't like the next most common one is what they call random orbit sander ROS and basically this pad that you put up here is going to rotate around circles but it's also going to move up and down left and right so supposedly it creates a very random pattern that is hard for the human eye to detect if there are any grooves on this one this is pretty much taken over the power sanding industry uh, in the last 15 years and pretty much everyone's going to be end up with one of these in their arsenal it will get you to a surface finish but I will tell you it is an abraded finish so even if you're going up to the 400 600 grits it's still going to look, look a little bit muddled compared to an ed, uh, surface that was cut with an edge such as a hand plane or even a scraper the other kind of uh, sander is a jitterbug sander or a little pad sander and these work by going in one direction and let me tell you something the best results I get if I am sanding a lot is doing the brunt of the work with this tool getting to the final grit maybe 400 or 600 grit and then using that same grit on this tool except instead of just randomly going all over the board run it like you would a hand plane straight up and down the grain because that will realign the uh, scratch patterns going with the grain which is a lot harder to see than scratch patterns going across the grain and scratches that go across the grain are going to tend to absorb oils and finishes more so they darken up a little bit after you finish it nothing more frustrating in the world to get a surface that you think is dead on perfect with something like this then you put the little finish on it and all of a sudden all the scratches kind of pop up and they look like little pig's tails all over the place if you use a jitterbug sander where the scratches are going to go somewhat in line or go back with a hand pad and just go back and forth a little bit to get those scratches all going along with the grain they will not show up as much after you put the finish on above the little handheld power sanders you now get up into the bench top models and I would tell you every now and then you get a category of woodworking tools where one tool kind of dominates for a long period of time this particular rigid model has really kind of put itself a head and shoulders in its small class price wise function wise and stuff like that and it is uh, what they call an oscillating spindle sander the, the sander portion you know it rotates around makes sense just like a belt sander but it also moves up and down so you end up using not only more of the sandpaper uh, if you're uh, sanding in pieces but it kind of randomizes the, the grit pad, gr, randomizes the scratches a tad bit. But this is a great item if you're using something like a bandsaw to cl saw close to a curved line, then you can use a tool like this to sand right up next to it. Kind of operates just like a spoke shave would in a hand tool where you are shaving up to the line. You can also swap out this head with what they call a spindle sander and that's just a simple tube that'll run up and down and those are really great if you need to sand on the inside of a curve now drum sanders aren't as common a power tool in most small shops but i do believe that is going to be changing over the next decade as cnc's kind of migrate into small garage shops because it's really easy to maybe spray paint a sign in the engraving and then run it through a drum sander which is basically just like a spindle sander you have a drum that has sandpaper it spins and it takes off just a minute amount now this could be something you would use just like a thickness planer to thickness a little bit and once you get down below about a half or three eighths of an inch thickness wise this is a much safer tool to use than a thickness planer for that purposes. Just put a really coarse grit on the wheel and they'll handle it, but it just takes forever because it's 
really, really slow. You're taking off a fraction of a 64th of an inch each time. But it can leave a really smooth surface the higher the grits you go. Plus the fact it's calibrated to be dead flat. So on something like this, which looks like a small machine, can actually handle a table width of flattening. Because it has an open end, you basically put half a table in through, then you come back through, and you put the other half through. So, you know, saying both halves, just not at the same time. Opens up a lot of flexibility if you're in a small production run of stuff. I love using this when I'm batching out like a dozen or a hundred boxes at a time, because I can get all the parts very consistent and finish ready and it's kind of a brainless task of just letting it run it run through. So the final category I want to talk to you all about is drilling holes. Now as woodworkers, uh, we've been drilling holes since the beginning of the craft. I mean, sticking a pole in a hole go, dates all the way back to the Adam and Eve era. And the tools they used back then, a lot of times, were just a sharpened rock at the end of a stick, and they made some kind of brace, maybe a crook of a tree to do that one. They might not have had any gears or anything like that. In fact, uh, uh, up until like the late 1800s, it was still just a piece of wood and in rotating it, it just slipped in your hand. They would put a little tallow or fat on their hands and just work it around. But when the Industrial Revolution came about, we came up with a lot more variety of drills. Um, one of the first, and one of the first ones was a push drill, and this was kind of a take off of the old jeweler's drills where they would use a small bow with a stick and move it back and forth. Well, this would do the same exact thing except you would push down and it's got a spiraling action as it goes down. So you would just simply push little bits. And what's cool is almost all of them had a means of storing the bits so you could carry it with you as you went about. Oh, I think I, I emptied this one out. Yeah, I emptied this one out, but they all, they would, oh, no, there we go. The bits would stay in the handles of a lot of these devices. So if you are a Finnish carpenter, this tool was commonly used with Finnish carpentry, well, uh, you would just keep this in your bag, and if you had to pre-draw holes for, like, installing hinges or something like that, quickly whip it out, a few pushes, and then you can drive the drill. Other ways of making, drilling the holes would be something like what we now call egg beater drills. You simply hold the handle and move it around like this. And they made a wide variety of these styles, uh, all the way from uh, new models that started in the 40s. This is called a Buck Rogers model. And yes, it was named after the cartoon character. Uh, one of the first instances of using plastic in tools, but it is a metal body. And once again, you just drop the bit in there and the handle holds your bits. Here's another version. What I think is cool about this one is you can articulate the handle so that you can get into crevices and stuff like that. Great for if you're doing inside walls uh, that you've already framed up. It'll even rotate kind of like that too. It's all separate. It's not the strongest thing in the world. I just keep around because I think it's a cool little tool. Now if you do want to look for a egg beater drill, I really I personally think the Miller Falls were some of the best made, and you can still find them fairly inexpensively out there. Sometimes you might have to turn a new handle, which means you won't have the box that will hold the drills, drill bits in there, but that's not that big a deal if you're working in your shop and you have access to those drill bits elsewhere. But make sure you find one, if you get a style, that still has a knob. The knob oftentimes got lost, but it is an important part of it because it keeps everything balanced. Because if you have the handle down a lower position and this counterweights it, it finds a nice balance point that will tell you when you're plumb. Ones that don't have that counterweight, they when they're truly plumb, they still want to fall over because the weight's all on the side. Now these types of tools, they drill holes up to about a quarter of an inch. I find that a quarter of an inch just takes a little bit too much muscle. Above a quarter of an inch, you generally go to a brace for the simple reason you can get so much torque on these. And they make braces in different sizes. The size difference is where the handle is located. 
Uh, I believe this is an 8 inch one, but they come in 10 and 12 inch ones. And even this one right here, you can generate so much torque with your body's leverage. You can drill holes faster with this a lot of times than even a lot of our modern day tools, especially if you have the right bits. Because the bits that they use with these have screws at the tip. So as you drill, they self-feed. And because a circle is both cutting with the grain and against the grain, if you remember our very first lesson, they also have little wings on the side that will cut the cross grains and then blades in the middle that will scoop out the long grain. So they can handle it all and you can really drive holes in fairly quickly. And of course they come in all different sizes. Now this style is called a Russell Jennings style. The other more popular style is an Irwin style. And the big difference seems to be where the metal is on the middle of that. The Irwins, they typically have the spirals not quite as much and the, a bigger gap in here that they say works better in softer woods to clear out waste. The other difference is the threads. You basically will find ones that have very fine threads and those are generally for hardwoods and the, the coarser threads are for softwoods. But what's cool about the threads is they are a consistent throughout a box. So I believe this one has 12 threads per inch. So if I simply rotate this bit 12 times, I know I will dr have drilled a one inch hole. And it's, it's really, really accurate that way. Now, when you look for braces like this, what the key things to look for is you want a pad that's not loose right here. As they wear down and they get a lot loose, these pads get loose. And if it's loose, you're not going to be able to uh, be as accurate. Now, you can tighten it up a little bit, but not much. Otherwise, the handle right here, as long as it moves freely, you'll be fine. Uh, the other thing is some of them are ratcheting mechanisms. Like this one right here, you can put in the center and it kind of it'll, it'll ratchet one way. I move it all the way around, it'll ratchet the other way. That way you don't have to go all the way around. If you're like inside a cavity, you can simply go halfway and it'll move it around. Otherwise in the middle, it's locked in. It'll, it won't go either direction. And then the chucks themselves, they come, the later ones had like three draw trucks and those work really well for modern day bits because they have shafts. If you get one that has two jaws in it, well, in actuality, those aren't straight jaws that are just clamping down like that. They actually have a little hump in the middle, and that is designed for the bits. Because you'll notice the bits have a square shank on the back, and that locks in there so that you can get a lot of torque on them. Unlike our more modern ones that are round and can sometimes slip. The final thing on these is it's quite often that the spring on those little jaws has gone missing or something like that. Somebody's disassembled it for cleaning or lubricating purposes and lost them. Having those springs in there is a nicety because they, they, it closes it up easier that way. Without them, you're constantly having to push it and manually open them up to get pieces in and then close it up. So just look for that spring if you're looking for a used version of these. And these types of tools you can find great deals on them. Going to auction site though, you are looking for pe you're competing against people that actually know what they are and are looking for them. But if you're in an antique store, a lot of times the dealers don't really know what they have. Or if you're just going to through a garage sale, and they're priced more reasonably there. Once you get into the mass internet marketing situations, you're you're talking to sometimes collectors or people that are just starting into it and they think they want to grab everything to, so they'll overspend that way. Other options is you'll spend a fair amount on them but going to a tool dealer, uh, specifically for vintage tools, you will know what you're going to get and that's a little bit of reassurance is kind of nice when you're first getting into it because you don't want to have to buy three or four of them just to find one good one. You'll end up spending a lot more. You spend a little bit more pay for their expertise, you'll get a tool that'll last your lifetime. Speaking of bits, you're going to find two main bits in woodworking. A general purpose one that's going to be kind of flat on the end, and these are actually kind of easy to sharpen, because all you have to do is put them up on a grinding wheel at the right angle and rotate them around. 
uh, the, you find these all over the place and a lot of times old woodworkers will have a coffee can just with dozens of them in there never knowing which is what size I keep these around uh, mainly for metalwork and aluminum and brass I personally hate them for woodworking because I find it's hard to center them because they kind of wander around before they start in I much prefer a brad point bit and notice it has a tip that tip will actually find a hole so if you you create a hole first and then you can come back and align that right where you want it to be and it will kind of center it as it goes down i also find that when they build these the the wings are a little bit sharp so they do cross cut grain act cutting very well and then the flats will clear out the waste in the long grain so they they can handle both cross and rip cuts these right here they're just kind of brute force and because of the way the wings are you never really get as clean a hole brad points are definitely woodworking focus so if you're getting a set and you need general work get that type if you're doing woodworking get a brad point next let's talk about the ones that burn electrons nowadays you basically have three different styles you have drills you have drivers and you have impacts though some of them are marketed as drill drivers or drill impacts a drill it's it does exactly what it says it drills holes it's kind of cumbersome to drive screws that's the difference one you're using a drill bit the drivers are you're generally using a screw gun to drive in a screw a drill driver oh a drill itself generally only has one gear though a lot of times you can control the speed with the trigger but it's pretty much wide full open most of the time so that's why it's so good for driving hole, drilling holes but if you're looking for ultimate control as you sneak up setting that screw as you drive it in not so much a drill driver well generally it has multiple gears and I've seen uh, two or three nowadays that's two's most common occasion you'll see it see a three speed one the, the first gear is kind of like your granny gear and it will get you a certain speed high gear gets you about twice that speed now I don't know the exact ratios but the low gear even with a 12 volt or 8 volt or 9 volt will give you enough power to drive in screws fairly easily because screws require a lot of torque and that's where this clutch comes into account because at a certain torque rating or a certain amount of power it'll start slipping so you can actually set that torque rating so that you can drive a screw deep into the wood and where it will never stop or it can go hit the wood and then get slightly flush or just right underneath it it all depends upon the compression of the screw head with the wood as how much power it takes to continue driving it so if you reach that certain amount of power and it slips you know you can get consistent depth of all your screws so when they say driver that's what they're talking about driving the screws in and that's where the clutch action comes into account if you're just drilling holes they generally have a setting uh, that's for drilling where the clutch is just locked all the time and it won't slip at all the other style you commonly see in woodworking shops is an impact driver and yes these are designed for driving screws in but the difference is and what makes them so unique is that once you get to a certain torque rating where the clutch is acting on these sometimes these just stop working because of the gear ratios these are geared quite a bit lower and whenever it hits a certain torque the impact thing comes in and what that is it's kind of like taking a hammer on a wrench and tapping it around to get it to move just a little bit at a time versus constant torque that quick rotation a lot of times allows you to drive easier with more control and a little bit deeper into harder materials without snapping the screw but until it needs that it'll just go really fast and then when it finds some resistance the impacting comes about and then you come to the larger stationary machines now I will say drills are one of those devices that really haven't changed much over time 
So if you can get, find a nice clean one from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, and it's a good deal, go ahead and get it. It will last your lifetime. And even if you have to rebuild something of it, it's generally very standardized parts just because they haven't changed much. The key things you want to look for, though, is you don't want the quill to move at all when it is fully extended. Okay? Now, some of them, uh, the vintage ones, will have adjustments, little screws, so you can lock that in there when it's fully extended. Some modern ones, especially some of the inexpensive ones you can buy from big box stores, don't have that. And the problem is, if you've extended it out and it starts to waller, you're never going to get a consistent hole. And that's important when you're doing joinery for like chairs and such like that. So, you just want to get one that's not worn out. The other thing I should mention is, get one with some decent amount of travel. Now this right here is a bench top version. But it is kind of the same exact thing as the floor standing version. All it is is a smaller pipe model right here. And I picked this one for the travel because it has enough travel that I can draw a hole for a pen blank. So if I want to turn a pen, a lot of them only have maybe two, two and a half inches of travel, especially the smaller bench top ones. So, Kind of figure out how deep the holes you want to be able to drill and look for the travel over a, a lot of other things like laser pointers and stuff like that. And if you are really interested in making furniture, eventually you're going to want to make square holes. Mortis, dedicated mortise machines will make square holes. And what they are is they have a square bit that this arm forces down into the wood, and then they have a drill bit in the center of that one that gets a wood, rid of the weight. So in essence, all you're doing with a square bit is squaring up the edges and the drill gets rid of most of the hole. These are great machines and they've kind of gone out of favor because of something called the domino. Uh, it, it's kind of taken that uh, place, which means you can a lot of times find them just dirt cheap. And a lot of people bought these for one or two specific tasks and then they got set to the side. So there are a lot of them that are very lightly used out there and available to purchase. I don't use mine much, but when I do, it's generally some kind of green and green or ladder frame design or something like that where you're, you're making four or five hundred square holes for a mass produced tenons. And this has more than paid for itself with just a couple of those projects. Well, I want to thank you for sticking around. This was one of my longer videos in this series. But if you have done a little bit of reading or something like that, it's basically the first four or five chapters of every single woodworking book you've ever bought. Because it seems like all of them need to cover what tools are, what they do, and that kind of stuff. And I hope I was able to bring a little bit more insight than just a paragraph or two you would have read on your own. Now, most of y'all are not going to need to buy all of these tools. In fact, the very first series I'm doing after this video, as we discussed earlier in the video, is just using this handful of tools I have on the workbench to accomplish most of the tasks I do with all these other tools. It just takes a little bit more time sometimes and a little bit of skill development. And being able to provide that kind of information of what the tools are, how they're used, how they interact with wood, and the skills required to do that one is the whole purpose of this course and the follow-up sophomore level courses that are going to branch out into the little niches of the craft. And we do this kind of, I just want to bring it up, it's kind of on a value for value proposition. Uh, so if you or you think other people get value out of this craft, please look down in the description below because I have a lot of ways you can help subsidize the cost of making this type of content for y'all uh, available through links and stuff and on my website. And as we wrap it up, I want you to remember one last thing, that it is always worth the effort to learn, create stuff, share it with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.